everybody and welcome back to another episode of the poker news podcast i'm your girl sarah herring with chad holloway and jeff platt we have had another exciting week in poker obviously i went to the lone star poker series which was not a surprise super fun and the founder miss kim stone who uh, i love also happens to be pregnant so it was really nice to really have this like pregnant bonding poker time together. I, I know of a couple other pregnant uh, poker women too, by the way, guys. So like, look out poker world. We're making a whole new generation of spawn for you. Um, but yeah, the tournament was awesome. I had a great time down there and I just really am excited in general about the potential and the future for poker in Texas and hopefully in several other states and even just areas where, um, you know, they don't have Indian casinos and stuff. They just want to have like poker clubs kind of on board. So correct me if I'm wrong and we'll get to the actual Lone Star Poker Series in a minute, but I do believe this is the first time on this podcast that you have blatantly admitted that you are pregnant once again. Now you've dropped a little, little hints here and there where Chad and I are like, uh, does she want to just go with it here or not? But I, I do believe that is absolute confirmation. Again, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, it's official. And actually, you're right, because I haven't like officially announced on you know social media or any of that. But uh, just the same as last time, it's the Poker News Podcast family <laughs> that finds out first. These are my the peeps. Exclusive. These are the people who know. Our like, loyal 3,000 listeners, you are the only people who know. Um, we are making another another herring and yes. another little secret that I'm not sure I was going to tell you guys before we started the podcast, but I may or may not be in talks with BBO Poker Tables to get the gaming table and to feature it on our podcast. I am so excited. Um, for those who don't know, uh, BBO Poker Tables has, they just started a Kickstarter campaign for this gaming table, which also doubles, by the way, as a dining room table, which is like this other cool function because you can like have your games going, then put the top on, like eat dinner and then pull the top off and just continue nice. your game. For those of you who play some of these games, I don't know if you ever have, but I have a few games where it takes a long ass time to get your pieces all down and ready. And you can't always finish a game in one night, but then your kitchen table's taken up for like three weeks and you have to eat, you know, on the floor in the living room. So anyways, it may not happen, but I really hope that it does. And I'm very excited. Uh, Correct. The baby's nice, do? but the table, the table will be fantastic. <laughs> well, congratulations. What did you, you guys do while I was gone? Well, I mean, Jeff had some drama on the social media sphere, which we'll, we'll get into a little bit. And, uh, yeah, I've just been uh, on the work grind. Like you said, the Lone Star Poker Series was going on. I did not get down there for this one. Um, there was just too much work to be done. There's some live tournaments coming back. You know, we've seen the Seminole Hard Rock wrap up, uh, which we talked about in last week's episode. There was a big event at Best Bet Jacksonville that wrapped up. There is another event coming up this weekend at uh, the Venetian MSPT Poker Bowl 5. And then, of course, football. You know, we were talked a lot about sports. Uh, we had a show with Phil Helmuth a couple weeks ago. So it's, uh, you know, the culmination of a, a great, albeit unprecedented football season. America, dude, we're coming back. We're yeah. having poker tournaments. I'm excited. Okay, but so obviously <laughs> you piqued my interest here. Uh, Jeff, what's yeah. going on, buddy? You, okay, by the way, even other people have commented to me. This is not just my opinion as the like anti-PC, like unpopular person. Jeff is like the most PC person. If you're an advertiser, you 100% want Jeff to be the host of your show. He just says the right thing all the time. So how Jeff found his way into some juicy drama, I will never know. Please share the details. Yeah, I'd be happy to. And, and I did text you knowing that you would be proud of me for just making some drama. You, you didn't know any of the backstory, but I think immediately you were proud for jumping in the mix. So guys, uh, Saturday night, a relatively tame Saturday night for me. Go to sleep a little bit before 11. Wake up fairly early on Sunday and see a couple tweets from ESPN World Series of Poker broadcaster Lon McCarron. Uh, tweet number one was showing no class again tonight at Jeff Platt and at Buffalo Hanks. That's my guy, Brent Hanks. Uh, let's see, tweet number two was 
What a disgusting display of Trump-like behavior from Real Kid Poker, that would be Daniel Negreanu. Jack Platt, hello, that's me again. And Buffalo Hanks last night. A different style of announcing is one thing, and that's fine, but for these two poker announcers to act like psychophants to the all-powerful poker god is beyond the pale. So, Lon McCarran was upset with our broadcast on Friday night, not Saturday night, Friday night, an edited clip went around of our post-game interview with Daniel Negreanu. We talked to him after every single session of the High Stakes Feud against Doug Polk. One of our post-game questions, it wasn't even a question. We were really saying goodbye to Daniel Negreanu. And it was my question was, all right, Brent, you know, should we let the, the president go? You know, Norman Chad has referred to us, the GG broadcast, as Russian state TV. Like, Negreanu can do no wrong. President Putin can do no wrong. That was his comparison on Twitter. We took shots at Norman throughout the broadcast, like we always, always do. And then we defended Norman, and then we complimented Norman, and we raved about him and Lon as Poker Hall of Famers that have had a tremendous impact on the game. But in that post-game interview, said something about Norman Chad that opened the door for Daniel Negreanu to go off on Norman Chad. He and Norman have their own separate feud and uh he certainly went off i thought that in the moment it was funny i laughed brent laughed and i think lon came after us because he thought that we should have uh stood up for norman chad i disagree with that i don't think it's our place on the gg stream to insert our opinions into interviews or we're just we're the into interviewers not the interviewees and I think we had sh we've shown enough support for Norman Chad throughout the course of all of our broadcasts. This is a bit. I mean, if you guys at home listening have listened to any broadcast that Brent and I have gone through, you've watched any broadcast, we always, always take shots at Norman Chad. And then we always compliment Norman Chad. And Norman Chad's been one of the most welcoming uh, figures in this entire game to me. I consider him a, a true friend. And, you know, because Negranu tells him to F off, that, that doesn't represent my feelings about Norman Chad. So, you know, Lon and I and Brent had some back and forth. You guys can get into it on Twitter if you want. And I I think we're good now. I, 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 I don't know. To be honest with you guys, I haven't talked with Norman yet. And I look forward to uh, when he would like to talk to me. And I don't know. I have an immense amount of respect for, for, both, for both Lon and Norman, uh, you know, that's, so really it comes down to the laughter you think is the real problem here? I don't think that's the real problem, but that's what Lon came after us for, for just laughing along with a Negreanu rant. And he's saying like, well, you aren't sticking up for Norman Chad. And I, I laugh at Negreanu's rants. I think they're funny. Like I, I just do, I personally do. Uh, you know, we're on the GG stream. So we're certainly biased towards Negreanu. I've mentioned that a thousand times that we're going to be biased towards him. Um, but I, I just, I, I don't know. I, th I think his rants are kind of funny. Norman completely disagrees, obviously. Lon completely disagrees, obviously. But, you know, when Negrani's going off, it, you want me to be like, excuse me, Daniel. Let's let's get serious here on this poker like, stream wah, wah. that's built for entertainment. Right, right, right. What a wah, dud. Wah. What a dud that would be. So I even had the disagree. same thing, even with, I, told, I think I told you that with Jungle Man once, like he was describing a situation that he had been in where he'd thrown chips at someone. And during the course of the interview, I never chastised him or told him that was bad or yeah. wrong or whatever. Like, not my business. I want to, I want the interview. So right, like, you're asking the questions. Yeah. This is not the opinion hour. This is not a podcast that we're doing with Daniel Negreanu. This is this is like uh, an NBA game, and you know LeBron James was the star, and they interview LeBron after, and they just ask questions and ask questions and ask questions. The interviewer, the sideline reporter, does not insert his or her opinion into the mix. And to be fair, sometimes, and I feel like Lon and Norm would know this like better than anyone. Sometimes, in the course of interviewing people, you also interject. Uh, Laughter, head yeah. nods, lots yeah. of things that are not even always necessarily things you're thinking about. It's just this is so part true. of how you get people to keep talking and how you be how you best communicate. You use those nonverbal, pseudo-verbal cues. Oh, Jeff. I was tell wondering you. when Brent Hanks was gonna take you down. Like, <laughs> I was wondering <laughs> when you were gonna go to the Brent slash anti Chardonnay level, and we're you're coming, boy. We're bringing you with us. <laughs> I'll tell you how this has to play out now. 
Negranu, Negranu and Polk, their challenge is about to finish. We're going to get into that here probably next. And then Polk has, Polk has already said there's not going to be a rematch. Right. I'd be interested in coaching somebody. So Polk coaches Lon McCarron. Daniel mm-hmm. Negranu coaches Jeff Platt. Heads mm-hmm. up challenge. A whole new mm-hmm. heads up challenge. 25, 35,000 hands, whatever it is. And you two just go at it. Yeah. Let's also, do it. Who's funding <laughs> this challenge? Because we're, I mean, Jeff is rich, but what about who's, Ron? who's watching this challenge? Like, <laughs> like 14 people? <laughs> I, don't think, you know, I don't know if the viewership will be as high as Polk versus Negranu, but I'm down. I like it. And also, shout out to everybody uh, on Twitter. There's just a ton of support that was thrown Brent's way and, and my way. And I know that some of that support came from some of our podcast listeners. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you again. That's right. Well, I, 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 let's talk about that Negranu Polk challenge then. We'll yeah. pivot uh, right there because this thing, it could be over today. I think they're going to play today as we're recording this, probably by the end of the week, uh, by all indications. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think isn't Polk back up to almost like a million dollars, like 900 and something thousand? Yeah, he's up $946,000. They do have just a little bit over 1,700 hands to play. Now, their longest session before this week was about four and a half hours, maybe a little bit more. On Monday, they went completely ham. They played for more than seven hours. They played almost 2,000 hands. So it does seem like, Chad, that they, they really want to uh, hit the fast forward button. You know, it's not that close at this point. I think they both realize what the results are going to be. Doug Polk hates poker. <laughs> I mean, he's, he's admitted it multiple times. He can't wait to get out to run for the hills. So I think, you know, we're taping this podcast on Wednesday, like we normally do. They have a session plan for Wednesday afternoon. And I think they might be going the whole way. So it's like six, seven hours, or maybe they save a little bit for Friday, but regardless, they are done by the end of this week. And this high stakes feud is over. Well, and obviously you're in the middle of all of it and talking to Daniel, you know, regardless of what you think about Daniel or, or his play or his personality or whatever, you know, he's very much a person who I think sets goals and really puts his mind to things and mm-hmm. quite frequently accomplishes things that I think most people would never expect. So where does he seem mentally at this stage where in some respects they're kind of just playing, it's just like playing itself out? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think that overall that he's, he's happy with his effort. I think that he's fallen in love with high stakes, no limit hold'em, heads up. And, and I think that he could take on challenges in the future. I think he's he's drawn to this aspect of the game. And, you know, he's got to be proud for being competitive with Doug Polk, one of the best heads up players in the history of the game. Polk is, is an absolute stud. And for Negranu to progress to the level that he is at right now, where Doug Polk has admitted that he is a, a worthy opponent and a, and a, a worthy competitor. And, and Doug Polk tweeted yesterday, you know, the two always study, right? They study after every session, they get prepared for the next session, they make little tweaks here and there. So yesterday, instead of studying with their respective teams, they study together. And Sarah will hate to hear that because there's no more drama between Negrano and Polk. But Doug said, quote, we have talked about hands and stuff here and there from the get-go. But today we really talked about a bunch of different situations and spots from the challenge. Some really fun stuff. One bluffy ran, I cannot fucking believe, LOL. Glad we buried the hatchet, a worthy opponent. And, and so I think that the respect level is there for, for Negranu as a heads up uh, player. I think, you know, if Negranu could have run a little hotter, of course it'd be, it'd be a brand new ball game. But, uh, you know, it's, it's been entertaining throughout the entire course of the high stakes feud. And, and I think, again, I go back to what I said at the beginning that Negreanu has to be proud of his effort and Doug Polk does as well. I mean, just an incredible player um, and some incredible results on the way for him. What was this drama I heard? I didn't really dive into it and Jeff, I'm sure you know, but like last week or a couple sessions ago, I was seeing all over social media about, was it Negreanu who was like tanking? Oh all yeah. Suddenly yeah. he's had some sort of tanking strategy. So in one of last week's sessions, maybe it was Monday, Doug Polk started to limp in on the button. Sarah, you'll like that. This the really specific poker strategy talk instead of making a standard raise. Uh, mainly, and Doug has said this, to play prevent defense, right? He had a big lead. So if he started limping in in pots, pots would be smaller, variance would be a little lower, et cetera, et cetera. 
Negranu, who has studied how to play versus a race on Wednesday, came out playing very slow, tanking just about every hand on every street. Doug was not thrilled with this. Uh, he paused play. They went to the mediator, who is Phil Galfon. Phil coming off his Galfon challenge win, probably just wanted to sit back and relax. And then he gets a phone call from Doug Polk and Daniel Negreanu. He has to deal with that. They agree that when Polk was limping in on the button, that Daniel could have all the time in the world. Daniel has told us he has a bunch of different things to go through when there is a limp on the button. It just takes him a while. Um, but then Polk st stopped limping, and then they started playing fast, and then all was good. So there was some drama for about an hour maybe an hour and a half. And then it was like, psh, it's gone under the rug. It's amazing to me and like a little bit confusing sometimes that the vitriol can be so extreme followed by we're good. Like everything's <laughs> cool. You know, it's one thing if you guys have, you know, like a pseudo drama or a little drama, but these players are like, I will effing bury you. You are disgusting. Like so much rage. Yeah. And then that we can just be like, you know what? It was great. Buried the hatchet moving on. Like, are we in a, some sort of like a sim that Doug and Daniel are like, like, they're like, we don't really hate each other, but we're just going <laughs> to do this funny game on social media. I kind of feel like, yeah, I don't know. Maybe we're being we're like puppets in this game, game that really Daniel and Doug are just playing on all of us. It's possible. Um, okay, well, moving on. I'll be happy for that whole thing to be over and for some other cool, fun drama to emerge. Fingers crossed. Um, the Yeah, let's move into the Mike Sexton classic, which was won by Daniel Devoris. And obviously, you know, I think he's come in second so many times, um, but in the last year or so, he's managed to have several, I think, pretty solid victories, but still for someone who I think is one of the most accomplished online players and certainly one of the best players mm -hmm. in the high stakes game. Uh, it was a long time coming, I think, for him to catch capture some major titles. And so I'm always happy to, to see him on top. And of course, this was a, a sick field. You guys can talk maybe a little bit more about it, but I did just notice that the a percentage of each buy-in was donated to the Nevada Partnership for Homeless Youth which for those who don't know, when I was arrested and had to serve what was essentially two full months of community service, I ended up serving them at the Nevada Partnership for Homeless Youth, which was actually a really awesome experience. So I just wanted to shout out to the homies, yeah. you know, at the Nevada Partnership for Homeless Youth. Let All me, Sarah, there and I were there. Are I, I'm going to do it before I get chastised by Lama Karen or anybody else. I'm going to ask the hard hitting question that's oh, just lingering there. What were you arrested for, Sarah, for those who don't know? Oh my gosh, everyone has to know. Um, I was arrested for, I had a little bit of brass knuckles in my purse, which I took to the airport and slid through the x ray machine um, to which they said, ma'am is this your purse and I said ha 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 funny story because actually it was a prop from a movie that I was working on I had the call sheets and everything doesn't matter this whole like possession is nine tenths of the law thing or something like that and they have extremely strict laws in California which um there was some sort of revolution in the 90s against gang violence and so um they have very specific uh, laws and punishments that have to do with the possession of deadly weapons. This brass knuckles is in fact a deadly weapon. And that is the crime I was charged with possession of a deadly weapon. And then also it's like an additional federal crime to bring that into an airport. I was facing the no fly list. Uh, it, I was facing jail time. And I was like, really, guys? I might have been a little bit drunk when I was packing to go to the airport. No, so like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't have a few cocktails when they know they're not going to drive for a long time? Um, anyways, fortunately, my husband, actually, my now husband, was at a charity poker tournament, met the head of the Nevada Partnership for Homeless Youth, told the guy my story, and he said, if she would like to do some community service, she can come work for us. Which I did. And it was infinitely more rewarding than like picking up garbage on the side of the 101 in Hollywood. Yeah. Actually like helped these kids learn how to make videos and 
little did I know, even at the time, really at the time, YouTube and all this was not really that big of a thing, but probably these kids are now making like rap videos and <laughs> basketball videos and whatever else they were interested in. Actually, they're all probably like 35 now. So yeah, it's cool. It's, I mean, you loved it and, and well, Mike it, Sexton it was, loved it. What'd you say, Chad? Sorry. I was going to say it was the, it was the charity that Mike Sexton's family chose right. to be the beneficiary of this particular tournament. So it wasn't a, a charity tournament per se, but it had that charity aspect. So it was a $10,300 buy-in with a certain amount of the proceeds going to that Nevada Partnership Homeless Youth Charity. 125 runners, so a nice turnout for this kind of like, kind of like a high roller. And then, like you said, Daniel DeVore is taking it down for almost 300K. I'm looking at the final table results, and there's certainly some Big names that stick out. Uh, Aram Zobian finished second for 200K. Mike Watson in third for 140,000. Uh, John Van Fleet was there. Uh, Eilis Parsinen out of Finland was there. So a lot of big names that I certainly recognize and were grinding out that WPT Montreal. And like Sarah said, it's been a hell of a year for Daniel DeVoris. He wins Super High Roller Bowl Bahamas, then the world shuts down, then he wins the World Series of Poker. Uh, millionaire maker event on GG in the summer. He's had a couple other big wins, a couple nice super million showing and the showings, and then just the momentum continues with this win. All that hard work. Well, while we're still over there in the uh, Montreal side of the world, Chad, do you want to tee us up for the WPT Montreal main on party? Yeah, another player in uh, addition to Divorce who has been hot is one Jack Hardcastle, who's going to be our guest this week. Now, if you recall, Jeff and I left last week's episode talking about the WPT Montreal main event final table. And at that time, Dan Shack was the chip leader. He did not end up closing it out. As I said, it was Jack Hardcastle who came out on top. Uh, Shack finished in third place for $212,000. And it was Jack Hardcastle out of the UK defeating Rayan Chamas out of Canada for the title, $447,000. And it was actually his second win in as many months. I'm sorry, not second win, his second big score in as many months. He was part of a four-way deal in the Poker Stars Blowout Series. Um, it was a $109 buy-in tournament, and he chopped that up for $270,000. So two hundred seventy k there to uh, 447,000 here obviously one of the hottest players in the poker world right now and that is why we had poker news's very own Jason Glazer uh, sit down with Jack Hardcastle and do this interview here it is so what well, so hello everybody i'm here today with Jack Hardcastle recently crowned a member of the WPT Champions Club Jack has been on what i'd like to call the winter of hardcastle uh, basically ended 2020 with a storm with big scores on many sites, including his biggest score at the time to date in a four-way deal in the big blowout. And then, uh, as if that wasn't enough, uh, Jack had to go on and win the WPT Montreal main event, 3,200 buy-in, 2 million guarantee uh, for his biggest score of nearly 450,000. So welcome, Jack. It's a pleasure to have you. And uh, what have you done to, uh, to celebrate this win? It must be difficult to celebrate in normal ways with everything going on, but did you do anything to celebrate your recent accomplishment? Uh, I couldn't actually do anything too crazy. It was mostly a few uh, sky calls that got a bit out of hand, but other than that, there was nothing really to do. I couldn't go out and celebrate. So, so like the old like virtual Zoom happy hours uh, to celebrate with... Uh, happy hour every hour, yeah. Happy hour every hour. And, uh, yeah, so you must have been, uh, this must feel like every day to you. Like in December, you had this big score and the blowout. And, uh, I know you, you felt on top of the world after that. So how, how do you compare how you felt after each one of those big wins? Uh, I think the blowout one was obviously that was incredible to actually get, but that was the first massive score that I had like that. So uh, it felt like very special when that happened. And that's not to say that winning a WPT isn't special, but that one just more felt surreal. Like, just like is this even happening? Can you run this hot? Like, it just didn't seem like it was fair. But obviously, I'm very happy about that one, too. Good, good. And, uh, you know, I know Jack. I met Jack about uh, two years ago. I was doing commentating at an MPMPT, and I saw Jack wearing uh, – 
eye-catching hoodies every single day. And uh, Jack went deep in that main event. And uh, we invited Jack to come on for the final day. Unfortunately, he didn't make it to the final table. And I was just blown away by your knowledge of poker. I was expecting to invite you in, and we joke around about hoodies and maybe talk a little poker. But your analysis was uh, was ahead of the curve even then. So maybe maybe you could break down for us uh, when you got into poker and uh, when you took it more seriously and who maybe some of the people that helped you uh, develop your game over the years. Well, I started, uh, at least with poker content stuff, before I was 18, watching videos. Like, I was, I had a, the game had sort of hooked me already before then, and then when I was 18, playing very small stake stuff, um, like, with a $50 deposit, and then grinded that eventually, but it took, like, over a year to get it to about 500, so it wasn't, like, a quick rise or anything. Um, but then I got some coaching from my friend Ryan LaPlante, who helped me out massively. Like, he got me, like, pretty good, and when I was at university... I was trying to do poker and university at the same time, which meant I did crap at both. Um, so I ended up dropping out of university. I was going to go back the year after and do a different course. But in the meantime, I thought I want to give poker a real shot here. So then Ryan coached me up every week from then on. It wasn't just an occasional thing. And thankfully, I just ran really far at the start and like spanned the few thousand that I had up to about 40k by April. And I was just like, oh, this is easy. I absolutely cracked it here. Then obviously, it doesn't always go that well, but. And when when did you start with Ryan? What year was that? Um, God, was that 2015? I guess. Okay, so a little bit a while ago. And then basically I met you playing live, and I think that's where a lot of people know you of because, you know, we can hide behind our screen names, but, you know, when you're face-to-face at an event and you're a pretty social guy, you you tend to meet people. So... Obviously, I know you're missing live poker to begin with, but what do you prefer? Do you prefer playing live or do you prefer playing online? You've had great scores in both. You've had two six-figure scores playing in live events as well. I'm definitely ready to go flat and to go back and play more live. Like now that I've got the funds behind me to go play every sort of 1K, 2K, 5K, I'm, I'm very much ready when that returns. Also, I do miss like the social interaction of the live events, but... I guess historically it was mostly online for a while and then it was starting to turn into live maybe in the last year before Corona shut down everything. So I, I'm really looking forward to going back to playing, playing live though. And is it going to be like as soon as you see a place open in Europe where you're going to basically uh, gauge things out a little bit? Because obviously like uh, in Europe we had the first wave which – wasn't too bad, and I know you played a little bit of live poker during the summer. We almost actually were in the same place at the same time. I, I was, I even covered an event during the summer. I played quite a bit of live poker during the summer too. But it seems like now people have more of like a wait and see kind of attitude. You know, maybe not jump in as soon as casinos reopen. What What are your thoughts there? Well, I might be in America before all of that, even because they don't care about the right now. So. Um, yeah, I understand that there's like an inherent risk of doing it, but I do want to go play live poker, and it is kind of how I'm expecting to make my money over the next few years as well, as online gets tougher. So um, I'll, I'll probably be in casinos as soon as they offer tournaments, but I don't see Europe offering tournaments, for, oh, at least not in the UK. Yeah. Like they didn't open tournaments all the way through 2020 when they opened up cash games. So. Because there are pockets of areas in Europe that do have casinos open, but they're not running big events because, you know, they're either closing at a specific time or they're not allowed to have more than a certain amount of people in the poker room, you know. So they're, it, it's prohibitive, but there's still some live poker going on in places like Malta and even Estonia. But it's not like yeah. the U.S. You look at the U.S. and, wow, I mean, I was blown away by the numbers in Texas, by the numbers in uh Florida, numbers in Vegas, it's just people are hungry to be playing. Uh, so, yes, I guess if you're itching, uh, I won't be surprised to see your name on the leaderboards in the United States either. Yeah, I genuinely think it's going to be the second boom by both when it returns. You're good. And let, let's hop into the WPT. I mean, this is the main reason I wanted to talk to you. Uh, I mean, it was a pretty sick event. It was a... Obviously, it was meant to be at the Playground uh, Poker Club. It's WPT Montreal, and for obvious reasons, it was held online at Party Poker. Hopefully, next year, we see it back at its uh, live home. Uh, but 888 runners, uh, just two opening fights, a 3,200 buy-in event. So this, first of all, wouldn't have been an event 
I would picture you just flying directly in a year ago, you know, or two years ago at least. Maybe not even two months ago, but uh, would, yeah, would have this event been, been on your radar <laughs> back then? <laughs> or was it a matter of, let's say, you were able to play it because of your big score in the blowout, or do you think you would have found a way to play it anyway, maybe selling pieces, etc.? Um, well, I wasn't sure if I was going to play it, first of all, and if I was going to, I was going to sell a decent amount off to friends, but I just fired the two satellites before, and then got through on the second one, and then by the time you're through, you've got less time to sell action to people as well, so I always sold more action if I just sold for it. So, again, like, another instance of me running really hot, that I just didn't sell as much <laughs> as That's true. But I guess you have, like, a couple of people, like your study buddies, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that you know will always take... Uh, action, you know, that you just have to give them a few minutes notice kind of thing. Uh, yeah, versus, like, I don't think I've ever seen you post on, like, a public board, for example, but maybe you have. Yeah, but I, I mostly, like, just give some pieces away to uh, post to a group of friends, but I'm sure in the future when live returns, I want to be selling probably more publicly to some of the bigger stuff, but online, I just don't really. Makes sense. Uh, and then... Uh, I was happy at the end that of, I believe it was day 1B, uh, when I saw your name on the leaderboard. Uh, you finished with a big stack right away. Um, so when when you have time in between, like, days, are you studying in between, let's say, day 1 and day 2, or in studying between day 2 and day 3 and day 3 in the final table, or is you don't really have time to even be thinking about that and you just cruise through each day uh, accordingly? <laughs> You have time to think about it, well, to study for it if you want to, but I guess, so between day one and day two, I didn't because it was the end of Sunday, I was knackered, I just needed to go to bed. And, um, um, I think if you wanted to just analyse it every single day, like study this ICM situation or this spot, the FT that could come about, you could, but then I think you're probably just not going to be able to play at 100% on the FT because you've already expended energy before. So, I, I don't know, it probably goes both ways. It's not really my style, so I just generally show up and confident in my ability, but I know some people who really analyze fun tables very hard and all those situations, they do well as well, so I think one's superior to the other. Would it make a difference to you if you had a week in between, let's say, day three and the final table, uh, like, uh, you know, like the WSOP had for some of its events over at GG? Yeah, another week, I think. You have to, because everyone's going to be doing it. But good, good. Um, yeah, and you, also, you can also still get the days of rest before it if, if you wanted to. So, yeah, but um, when it just goes back to back to back to back, I think it's just important to reset and you know, not, not be tired before the final table or things like that. Good, good. And then... On day one, you finished with a big stack. On day two, you were also near the top of the leaderboard uh, as well. I think you were at least in the top half with 23 players, I believe, going into day three. Uh, were you just cruising along, or were there any spots that you got lucky or any spots that you made, like, a fantastic uh, bluff in the early part of the day to set you up, you know, with a top four stack heading into, uh, you know, the final table? Obviously, on day three, we know about the big hand, but uh, on the first two days. <laughs> yeah, uh, first two days, uh, I can't remember anything, like, exceedingly, yeah, like, huge, like, no huge bluffs, no massive suck outs or anything. I mean, like, I won a few flips, but that's pretty normal, I think. Just getting Jack Saturday's king for 30-something bigs and hold probably more than, more than the average amount, but like, it wasn't anything crazy. And then obviously day three, it went a little bit off the rails. Yeah, let's talk about that. So it was an interesting spot near the end of the day. And, uh, I mean, you know the players better than I do. And Pocket H shorthanded. You were shorthanded by then, I believe. You had six players in your table. It might have been seven, if I remember correctly. And you show up with Pocket H and probably hoping at best to be flipping. But two over pairs show up and... Uh, Basically, you were looking to hit the showers, but instead you eliminated one player and doubled up. So, obviously, that's that's a good feeling, and it's not like uh, was it a spot though? Looking back at that, you could have avoided, or are you always getting it in there with uh, with the pocket eights and just happened to get there this time against the two overpairs? 
So I looked at it a bit afterwards, and it, it is close. It went hijack open off 90 beta's chip lead on the table with a six-handed table, and then, uh, forget his name, but it's, it's like over the top and stars. Like one of the really good German guys kills the button of 60, and he's just going to be quite wide there, I'm pretty sure, because he's, he knows his edge post spot, he's going to be wanting to mix it up a fair bit. So I've got eight in the small blind with 32 bigs, and if it was versus any two of the tighter positions or tighter players in this situation, I would have just flattened the ace and gone to a flop. But because it's a wider chip lead and a wider button, I rejammed for 32 bigs. Uh, I still think it's completely fine. I've looked at ranges afterwards. It, it's close, but I believe that the button's flatting more than the ranges say that he should be. So if that is the case, and I think it is, then the shove is profitable again. It's hard because in those spots, too, you don't know how often you're going to be playing for that kind of money on, like, one decision. So it was really showing a lot of guts. And it's not the only time he showed guts uh, throughout. I mean, I watched the entire final table, and there were some very nice calls. I, I saw a very nice bluff by you. Uh, so it seems like maybe mentally in your head you're kind of blocking the amount of money out, or is that not the case? You're just trying to focus on – what the best decision is as if it was like another, let's say, $50 buy-in event, or it's you, you're not really doing that? Um, so it wasn't like pretending it was the big 55 or something like that, but I I don't know. I did absolutely just have to put it all to the side and just be in the mindset of I'm going to play the best I can right now, and that's all that's, all it's going to be. And I, I don't know. I just felt really in the zone for that final table as well. Like I think probably grew in confidence as I've, like got a call correct or a bluff through or something, but I just didn't think I made a mistake heads up or well probably shorthanded even. It was a great structure, so it gave you a lot of time also to pick your spots. The forty minute blind levels online is ridiculous. I don't remember seeing that very often any at any time. I mean that translates probably to having like close to two hour blind levels live where it's at least ninety minutes. But, yeah, that's uh, awesome. not right. So that has to make a big difference going into the final table. I mean, you were near the chip lead, but it looked like you were being very patient in the beginning, waiting for, you know, a good spot. You even were one of the lower stacks at one point, I believe when it was seven-handed, and, uh, you know, found a good spot with ace-king versus, I believe it was ace-three, to uh, to double up, and it seemed like from there, you know, you were off to the races. Yeah, so I, well, the, the bigger rule in was the Kings versus King Queen suited that happened shortly afterwards, but I got it in 85% and had to feed the gutter for a lot of chips. But, um, yeah, so as soon as you win those couple of all ins and you're like, right, we're, we're in it now. Like, and we, we can start to apply pressure on, because I think at the start I've just been very careful of not making my skin mistakes. I don't want to just punt it in eight or something, so. I was trying to look for uh, the more clear-cut spots. And then as you get shorthanded, and then the pressure is kind of released a bit because we've already locked up a fair bit of money, then I think I was just like, more confident and just completely start to run it over. It was, a, it was a pretty talented final table. I mean, obviously, with a 3,200 buy-in event, you're going to expect uh, some talent. Uh, how did you feel about the final table coming in? How did it, let's say, compare to the big blowout final table that you had in terms of... Uh, Overall talent, uh, obviously you have guys like Dan Shack who, you know, winning, winning the event is nice, but it's not going to, you know, change his life in any way, you know, what games he plays, et cetera, et cetera, you know, with the title. Uh, what are your thoughts there? I actually thought it was quite a soft final table in the context of a $3,000 buy-in because all the stickers went out between 10th and 20th. Like if you check the lobby and just see the, the names that went out, it's kind of crazy. Um, but yeah, it's obviously that was a tougher, tougher final table than the blowout one because the 109 with 40,000 people should be really soft. So. And and does winning this money change your lifestyle at all, or is it all going back into poker? You know, like a, you know, between the two events, you've won now around 700,000, give or take a few thousand, one way or the other. Yeah, my my mum and my nana are sort of nagging me to buy a house, and I don't think I can really blame them at this point, so I might have to do that. Um, but I, I'm mostly just waiting for live focus with her to be able to buy pieces in all of my friends at every good tournament. And I think like the real work, I'm 
and, and sounds weird, but probably begin to spend live the terms because I think I should be playing at every single event that's around. But I don't think there will ever be a spot like this again. Like life hopefully is going to be make or break for so many people in the next five years. So backers, if you're listening, Jack is available for 10K and higher events. Uh, give him a good deal. Uh, <laughs> He'll, he'll maybe toss in some of these 1Ks, you know, as well into the backing deal, you know, to, to plan things out. But uh, keep it in mind when live comes back. Uh, I hope I hope we see it back soon. Uh, you know, we had such like a teaser this summer. We had a taste and then they took it all away again. I mean, can you imagine the absolute state of it when it returns? Like EPT is getting 3,000 runners. I wouldn't be shocked at all. But the, the PSPC in Barcelona – let's say 2022, how massive is that 25 day going to be? Between between the demand and just the Bitcoin prices uh, going through the roof, who knows what it'll be by the time we're done with this, but uh, always when Bitcoin goes up, everything, you know, with poker, all of a sudden you see, you know, like uh, people that you wouldn't expect to see in 10Ks and 25Ks. Oh, yeah, please. Uh, I mean, I have zero Bitcoin, so I'm not riding that wave at the moment, but maybe I should be. Who knows which way the wave will go, though? Yeah, it's all just hypothetical, really. Good, good. And, uh, yeah, I believe that is all that I wanted to cover. That's a good 20 minutes of content. I had one other question, and I'm not sure this will continue, and they're going to have to edit the end of this anyway for the uh, if they're using this in the podcast. But does Party Poker using real names – help you and at all while you're playing or when you're studying or does that not matter to you like you you when you're playing online you think in screen name anyway i don't think it matters too much uh, other than making hender mobbing people a lot easier but anyone who's really good you generally tend to know their real name and screen name anyway so i don't think it matters too much in the high grind stuff i, I do it, it is a bit weird in the 55 dollar comps when you just see like keith smith like in in the mix, but normally, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think it matters too much. Good, good. And what is next for you? Uh, do you have any plans? Or are you waiting for like another festival series to be announced somewhere? Me and a couple of friends are looking at going to Mexico and getting out of here, but not on some sort of holiday. And um, probably just move out there for a few months until things calm down, and then hop over to America and then play stuff in Vegas. Hopefully, there'll be some. I don't think it'll be full WSOP, but like some reduced series. Um, I'm, if the vaccination rollouts are as good as they seem to have been so far, I can see that happen. Yeah, I believe that's going to be the determining factor, and hopefully people are open to taking it as well. But let's uh, let's see what happens there. And there's a lot of there, there's a lot of pockets of UK grinders in Mexico. So are you friends with any of them? Is that why you're picking Mexico, or it's just pretty random? Um, a few of them, yeah. Um, also, just a couple of other friends who were looking at places to go. And in terms of the visa requirements and also just the what's open because of COVID, like Mexico just seems like the place to go out of everywhere. Like Europe's not going to be anywhere. It's not going to be warm. It's not going to be that free to do anything for a while. So we're looking at just getting out of here entirely. Might as well. Young, single, and... Uh... Might as well go to the warm weather of uh, Mexico. You're not leaving, uh, you know, you're just going to leave the, the gray skies of uh, the UK behind for a little while. <laughs> yeah. One of my friends said something like a pretty funny story because he knew someone who's already out in Mexico that he's going to go out there. And he got a message from him one night, absolutely like, devastated. He's like, George, they put Mexico into lockdown, blah, blah, blah. And um, it turns out the day after, he's just like, what, what were you on about? He's like, yeah, they're shutting the bars at 12. <laughs> that doesn't count, does it? <laughs> if that is what your idea of a lockdown is. <laughs> yeah, then maybe we should all go to Mexico. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, Jack, for your time. And uh, as always, wish you the best of luck uh, on the felts and in life in general. Hope I get to do commentating with you again another day. It was very uh, interesting. Or I hope we get to start a party in an airport again, but that's a story for another time and another place uh, and, another, and perhaps even another channel. Yes. Airport beers are the best beers for sure. Okay. Take care, Jack. Thank you.
GG Poker continues to revolutionize online poker with exclusive new games and features that set it apart from the opposition. Play at neck-breaking speed on the site's exciting spin and gold jackpot sit-and-go events and win big. Or grind it out in the weekly $300,000 guaranteed GG Masters. You guys will not want to miss out on the GG Poker bonuses. You can get either $100 in cash and free tickets or 100% match bonus up to a maximum of $600. You guys definitely do not want to miss out on their match deposit bonus. You can check that out on pokernews.com. Be sure to search GG Poker bonus on pokernews.com. Well, as everyone knows, I love a good juicy drama, but if I can't get a juicy drama or controversy, even some sort of, you know, like pseudo maybe drama, a little bit of fireworks, I'll take it. And we definitely got that. Um, while actually I was at the Lone Star Poker Series, I was talking with um, some, I want to, is it Eric Anderson, Chad? Eric Anderson. It, yeah, I worked with the MSPT. Yeah, spent many years on the road with Eric, many miles, many hotel rooms shared. Eric's a good buddy of mine. Really liked him. He was a great guy. And he was talking actually about how they had just had a fantastic stream for the World Series of Poker Circuit, which featured, drum roll please, in first and second place. But of course, they didn't know that at the time. But heads up against each other, Chris Mormon and Katie Lindsay, aka Katie Lindsay Mormon. So married couple up against each other. Now we've seen similar situations in poker before. We've seen, you know, couples playing against each other. There's always the question of, you know, soft play. I can say for sure Katie Lindsay is never soft playing Chris yep. Norman, not, not yeah. in regular life <laughs> or um, on the felt. And amazingly, Chris beat her. I cannot even imagine he will probably never live this down and even had, had, you know, shared how difficult it was. But I think it's also just a testament to, you know, what a, what a person of integrity Chris Mormon really is, because let's get real life Evie, they both come home with the same amount of money. And probably if Katie wins, he's got a happier life. <laughs> Chad, they talk to you, right? Yeah, I reached out to them, obviously a pretty interesting story. So when I seen it, I knew I had to, to get their take on it. And it was fun, you know, like, they want to win. Um, in some of the reaction to it, as far as people just immediately jumping to conclusions, you know, that, oh, like this is a married couple, there must be shenanigans going on and, and things like that. And I get it, like, but that shouldn't be your first assumption, right? And and if you know Chris Mormon and Katie Lindsay, you know that that isn't going to be the case. And let's face it, I won't say like, yeah, soft play. That's like, it's to me, that's like an intentional thing. Hey, let's get together and soft play each other. But when it is a married couple or when it is friends or somebody you grew up, whatever it might be, there is a different dynamic and there is no denying that, you know, that's just part of the game. And, you know, it's rare that we see a married couple or a poker couple go heads up. You know, we've seen it with Kristen Bicknell and, uh, William Foxen a while back, but I don't know. I just, I thought it was a great story. I kind of hated to see that kind of negative slant that some people took, like, you know, like that was just their first impression. And I thought, you know, that's kind of sad. Yeah. Um, and, um, but yeah, congrats to both of them. I think it was a, a fun story. And like, we all know them pretty well. We've all had interactions with them and know that they're a great poker couple and that there would be no such shenanigans. And uh, I, you know, I can almost picture myself watching the glee that they were experiencing going heads up against one another, trying to, to win that uh, ring. And I really appreciate them taking the time. They both chatted with me. They both gave me their perspective and their thoughts on it. And you can read that article up on Poker News right now. It was a really interesting article, I thought, of course, because yeah. I just love the love the honesty that they both had. And I, you know, I thought it was interesting also because I think Katie has many other skills outside of poker, but really in the last few years, she's since she's been traveling the circuit more with Chris, she's really focused a lot more on poker. And you can see her game has improved so much. And I know this just from playing home games with my own husband, that the metagame between, you know, we always talk about these high rollers who play against each other all the time and how they kind of know how this person's going to play, or they know that this guy knows that he told him about playing this hand this way. And like, it goes so many layers deep. And certainly Chris Warman and Katie Lindsay are talking hands with each other all the time. So I think actually 
in terms of playing each other, it was probably super, super interesting um, for both of them and infinitely, you know, deeper than, you know, playing against almost anyone else. And I know from Heath, like I want to beat Heath more than I want to beat other people for some reason. So I'm sure for Katie too, you know, and maybe, I don't know that it goes both ways, but uh, I'm sure she, I'm sure it was a crushing, a crushing blow. And I'm sure it won't be the last we see of them both at a final table together for sure. And I love how she told Chad that, you know, usually they play poker in separate rooms, but for heads up that she came into the office so she could stare at Chris <laughs> Mormon so she could get the reads off of him. Um, yeah, great story. Love what they have to say. Love those two. I think they both represent poker really well. Well, over in the old Midwest, Chad Holloway, we got some freaking fantastic news this week. It's just right across the pond for you. Um, and I'm fairly certain that you also were the one who was writing the story about Michigan. Am I right? Yeah, I mean, Michigan is across the pond, so to speak, but it's also a neighbor because we have the Upper Peninsula, which is about a three, three and a half hour drive from me. So when they do have the Michigan Championship of Online Poker on Poker Stars, which they're going to do, I don't know when, but they've already said they're going to do it. I might make the trip up there and, and do yeah. a little bit of grinding on Poker Stars for the first time in, in 10 years. So that's pretty exciting. And being in the Midwest, having our first taste of licensed and regulated online poker is certainly exciting. I have a lot of friends uh, and players that I know in Michigan that I chatted with over the weekend as they got to fire it up and grind because this just went live late last week. We knew it was coming. Um, other online gaming operations had launched in Michigan and it was just a matter of time before the gaming board gave the green light on poker. And when they did, Poker Stars was ready to go. Right now it's a segregated market, meaning they're just allowed to play against other players in Michigan. But the plan is to do an interstate compact. The governor has already signed some legislation and it sounds like at the end of March, thereabouts going into April, we might see you know a site like PokerStars join their player pools with New Jersey. Right now, Pennsylvania is still segregated, but man, can you imagine if they can work it out? So Michigan, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania are all playing um, you know, the same player pool on poker stars. I think that would just, you know, party poker is another one that could be doing that as well. And um, I just think that's very exciting for the future of online poker in the States. We've already seen it last week's episode was state representative Jim Casper out of North Dakota. He's looking to get some online poker going in that state. And so states will take notice. And I literally, I did this yesterday. I sent emails to both of my Wisconsin state representatives and I sent links and I said, look, Michigan is doing this. North Dakota is considering this. Why aren't we considering this in Wisconsin? Get them. Who knows? Probably won't lead anywhere. But yeah, if everybody was doing that with their state representatives, maybe we can, uh, you know, breathe a little oxygen and get this fire started. I, I completely agree with that. Listen, states need money and sports betting and online casinos and online poker is, is the path to getting some of that money. Like Chad said, I, I think it's very realistic to look at the end of 2021 and to see a player pool that does combine Michigan and Pennsylvania and New Jersey and Nevada. I know that 888 is uh, the only operator here in Nevada at this time. 888 and Caesars have extended their partnership for at least a couple of years. And I, I think they are close to either bringing in Michigan or bringing in Pennsylvania or both. I don't how close Poker Stars is. I don't know how close Party Poker is to jumping into the Nevada landscape. And then, of course, you have uh, the big guys in GG, and you know that they have to be eye in the United States as well. So the future, all of a sudden, for online poker looks looks pretty bright, at least for these next couple of years. And you know, don't kid yourself. It's it's not necessarily online poker that's the hot hot right. button tip ticket here. It's sports betting, right? So. Right online poker can hitch a ride, you know, hitch their trailer to that truck, that unstoppable truck of what is sports betting. And that's what we're seeing is, um, you know, we have poker stars, they have that relationship um, with Fox bet who in, in stars casino, that's kind of the real moneymaker. And then poker gets to come along for the ride. And that's what we want to see. So when you see states like I know Iowa right now has uh, sports betting, I don't know what the situation is with the online aspect of that. But that's one of those things like, all right, they probably don't care much about online poker, but if they already have these other things going on, maybe it'll just toss online poker in there. And that's what we hope to see through other states in the future. 
and we don't have the money to grease the palms, but someone does, and they should be <laughs> doing that. And in the meantime, we can be emailing. And I did see that um, in the article, Chad, that you posted last week with the North Dakota representative, that there was a way, actually a link to find out who in your own community are the you know appropriate people to be reaching out to. It's generally very easy, actually, to do so. Yeah, I, it's as simple. I just Googled Wisconsin state representatives, typed in the county I lived in, and boom, up pops their information. You could call them, you could email them, you could write a letter if you're, if you're still into that. And um, I actually had, this is a few years ago now, but I contacted a state representative. This is probably five, six years ago. And he actually came to my house. He took the time to want to meet one of his constituents. And we sat down for 45 minutes and he had no idea about online poker. And I had the opportunity to you know, at least educate him and, and make him aware that this is a thing. And so that was kind of cool. I don't think, you know, every state representative is going to have that time and opportunity. But, uh, you know, here in the Midwest, it's a little bit slower pace of life. And yeah, he came over and that was pretty Dude, cool. Wisconsin. And even in North Dakota, he's like, we don't even have an office. We just have this little piece of a desk here in the house. I was like, that's amazing. I like you. You know, I felt I felt like the Poker News podcast last week was like, not that we're illegitimate, but I felt like, wow, we have a representative who is sitting on in the Capitol building on yeah. the legislative floor doing a podcast with us. It just felt, you know, pretty, pretty cool. It was a, a unique experience for sure. Yeah, I remember when I interviewed Kevin Hart for the podcast and I said, welcome to the Poker News podcast. And he laughed. And then I was like, OK, well, I thought this was legitimizing us, but yeah. I just got put right back in the place where I belong. So thank you. Um, well, I don't know, actually, if anyone else is even writing articles on PokerNews.com anymore. Um, but Chad, did you want to, we've been talking for the last, you know, month or so about the World Series of Poker circuit events being online, they're moving, you know, I think everything is moving online and why not, you know, let's just keep the, the movement going, if you will. Um, and they wrapped their first Super Series in January, which you wrote about. And then you also wrote about the MSPT Bowl 5, like you might as well, like, you Which article it, yeah. did you not write? <laughs> yeah, this I'll week. Just yeah this it's, Chad and you can just go ahead. It's been busy. Yeah, so the WSOP circuit is, you may know, is holding an online series every month throughout 2021. When the live stuff returns, we do not know, maybe towards the end of the year. But right now, the online series are going to be the substitute. And they wrapped up, as you said, we already talked about Chris Mormon's ring victory. Um, I think there was 18 different events in the January uh, Toby Lewis, Aaron Frey, go through this list here. Daniel Jordan, Daniel Lupo out of New Jersey, uh, Justin Turner, John Riordan, uh, are some uh, Alex Butcher, uh, Jasthi Kumar are a couple of the people who have won rings. And then in the main event was a $525 uh, tournament, 893 runners, and it was AJ Basilini Trusi winning it for just about $68,000 and the gold ring. Now, anybody who wins a ring this year will be qualified into a season ending $250,000 guaranteed online circuit championship. The date of that is to be determined. Uh, there's other ways into to, uh, to that tournament. You can win a second chance fast forward event. You can also finish atop of a player of the month leaderboard. And for January, that was a familiar name in Daniel Buzgan, who is a pro out of New Jersey. So We'll keep an eye on that. We'll be doing uh, recaps. Jesse Folan will be doing various streams from a lot of these WSOP circuit events throughout 2021. So you can definitely tune into that. And then you mentioned the MSPT. It's Super Bowl weekend. And a tradition that I helped start, I'm actually pretty proud of this. Uh, back in the day when I worked for the MSPT, we were talking about Amarillo Slim's Super Bowl of Poker, right? This, this very uh, prestigious event in the past that hasn't been around. And I kind of broached the idea of like, well, maybe we can bring that back. I don't know where the copyright lies and this and that. So we kind of did a little research and it turns out using the, the term Super Bowl in any sort of yeah. marketing is, is no go. pretty, yeah, no go, pretty tough to do. But we thought, all right, what about Poker Bowl? And it's become an annual tradition at the Venetian in Las Vegas, the days leading up to the Super Bowl. And it's designed to finish the day before the Super Bowl. So it will finish on Saturday instead of Sunday, which is, different from most MSBT events, but that way everybody's in town, they are done with the tournament and they have the opportunity to watch the big game. And so this year it's gonna be a, the same format, $1,100 um, 
buy in. The uh, guarantee is lower. Last year it was a million dollars, which it surpassed. They are knocking it back to $350,000. They are knocking it back from three starting flights to two. And that's just because of COVID, right? The yeah. COVID precautions, they have less space. They can't just crank off the players. So that makes sense. And Poker News will be doing live updates. Mo Nuara is in flight right now as we're recording this. He texted me. Uh, he's on his way out there to do updates. So tune in this weekend for that. And of course, we'll talk about that on next week's episode and then real quick another tournament and this is a tease for next week's episode as well uh, i'll be talking to scott stewart who is a pretty well-known poker grinder you know he hasn't been on tv or he's not the biggest name but he's certainly you know won a lot of tournaments won a lot of money 2.2 million in lifetime earnings the most recent success was down at best bet jacksonville which just wrapped up their winter open he won the 2000 dollar main event 510 entries took that down for hundred and seventy seven thousand dollars so i'm going to chat with him we'll have that interview in next week's episode and i really am just curious to know what his experience was like playing down there in florida because between vegas and florida those are the two really hot spots for poker right now that are up and operating and have good procedures in place to hold rather large tournaments so definitely looking forward to getting into it with scott stewart next week well, we want to at least give a shout out to our sponsors before we talk about one of our last and I think one of the most exciting stories after this. Run It Once is a brand new online poker site founded by poker superstar Phil Galfond, who has the player's experience at heart. Run It Once plans to make online poker fun and less predatory while providing ample rewards and innovative features at the same time. All new Run It Once players who download the software via Poker News are entitled to a 100% deposit bonus worth up to 6 100 euros. What makes this welcome bonus unique is that you can make as many deposits as you like for that first 30 days after your first deposit. This makes it perfect for those players who do not want to or cannot deposit 600 in one chunk. Be sure to check it out at once.run slash pnpod. That's once.run slash pnpod. Well, certainly one of the least divisive and most loved characters in the poker world of all time would have to be Thor Hansen, who passed away not too long ago, I believe, from cancer, although he had been fighting it for some time and continued to travel the circuit and continued to be a bright and smiling face on the circuit. One of the first people to really welcome me, I felt like, onto the EPT in a spot where I was very nervous to approach him. And then afterwards would always, you know, wave at me from his seat and always remembered who I was, which was something that I just always was really grateful for. And um, apparently they're making a documentary. Who's in charge? What's going on here? That sounds like a great idea. <laughs> I'll tell you what, they've made the documentary. I have seen the documentary. They reached out to me, to me uh, last year at the end of the year and kind of said, look, we made this documentary. It is, you know, uh, out of Norway. It's in Norwegian with the uh, subtitles, but they said, we just, you know, it came out last year and we didn't really have a budget or anything to market with, you know, would you, you know, help us spread the word a little bit? And I said, before I commit, let me check it out, you know, let me watch it. And so I watched it while I was in Vegas for the world series of poker. And I was simply blown away. And uh, I don't want to, you know, overstate that. I, I think Thor Hansen, as you said, Sarah, is somebody who's been universally beloved. I rank him right up there with Mike Sexton as far as like a, a nice guy, just a genuine human being who's done a lot for the game. I was very sad when he passed away. And so I was, of course, very curious about this documentary. Uh, it's called Smile. And I think that's very uh, appropriate because he did a lot of that himself. And he also brought that on to a lot of players' faces. Um, and this, this documentary, it's about 75 minutes long, and it really gives you an inside look at Thor Hansen's battle with cancer, um, going through that with the support of his wife, uh, Marcella, uh, who, who I didn't even know anything about, but he met as a poker player back in 1999. They had, have been married ever since, and she was right there with him every step of the way, and I just thought that was incredibly mm -hmm powerful and you see him you know going in for for his treatments you see how he went from 
you know, living a high life in the United States. I mean, he, this was a personal friend of Larry Flint playing in those cash games mm -hmm. to he relocated back to Norway, uh, you know, for the healthcare system and, and things like that to, to spend his later years. He talks a lot about his, you know, he was a horse better and in, in how that impacted his life. And it was just overall, it was just very, very well made, very uh, heart wrenching. And I just thought, okay, I'm going to do whatever I can to help get the word out because Thor was a great guy. You guys have done something great here. So there will be an article publishing on Poker News that has information, has an interview with the filmmakers that has the link to watch this documentary because it is available right now on Vimeo uh, for rent. It's, I don't even know offhand, just a couple of bucks to watch this. And I'm telling you, it's a, it's well worth the money and, um, I've since learned since doing some research into this that he actually has a book about him as well. It's it's only, it came out like 10 years ago. Um, it's in Norwegian that's never been translated to English. And I think that's a damn shame. I think uh, mm -hmm. if there's any listeners out there who are fluent in both Nor uh, Norwegian and English who wants to maybe translate a book, I I've actually been in touch with the author and he is keen to have it translated to English if ever possible. And I sure would love to read it, but uh, yeah, I, I, Sarah, I know you're going to watch this. Jeff, I know you'll probably watch it too, and I can't recommend it more. Yeah, I, I watched the the trailer this morning when you texted us, letting us know that you wanted to uh, discuss it, and I, I I cried during the trailer. The trailer was so powerful. I mean, Thor Hansen, just such an icon, but more than that, such a, a genuine human being with an unbelievable amount of character. So I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to watching this. And what a labor of love to, yeah. you know, I've worked on several documentaries in my uh, career and it, they're very, very rarely profitable. They're almost always something that, you know, is done because you, you care about the subject matter and, you know, more often than not, you pay money to make these documentaries and it takes a lot of work and a lot of effort from a lot of people. So, um, you know, cheers to whoever put this together and cheers to Chad for, putting it on the show. And I know Mo's probably going to cover this MSPT, but I'm sure he's also going because he wants to be able to place some sports bets, yeah. which you can do if you live in the city of Sin on the Super Bowl. And we did talk a couple of weeks ago about who was going to be going to the Super Bowl, if it was the Wisconsin guys. And the, anyways, can, yep. who's good. going to the Super Bowl, guys? Uh, it was neither of the teams that I wanted. Uh, you know, I wanted the Packers and Bills. Instead, it is the Tampa Bay Buccaneers led by Tom Brady going to the Super Bowl again for him. And uh, they're going against the defending champions, the Kansas City Chiefs. I like the Chiefs in this matchup. And uh, real quick, just a real quick plug. Uh, there is a great free competition still open on Poker News. I'll put it in the show notes. Uh, Odds Checker US is giving somebody the opportunity to have a free $1,000 bet on this game so you can either put it on the buccaneers you can put it on the chiefs my money would go on the chiefs but uh yeah check that out in the show notes all you got to do to end email and one but somebody will be started at random um it's it's that simple so we check probably out. can't enter huh it's probably not probably not legit <laughs> yeah saying it also what about you I jeff who's wait, who, who, wait hold on so well, who's Jeff's pick? I want to know Jeff's pick. Okay, though. so Chad, I got the Chiefs, but I'm taking them by the money line. So I'm going to go minus 160, minus 170-ish, however you can get it. And then I also have, ready? Deep breath. Patrick Mahomes over 21 and a half rushing yards. McCole Hardman over two and a half receptions. McCole Hardman to score the first touchdown at 15 to one. A defensive or special teams touchdown, the no on that at minus 270. Leonard Fournette over 11 and a half carries. Rob Gronkowski under 30 and a half rushing yards. Chris Godwin over five and a half receptions. Scotty Miller under 23 and a half receiving yards. Heads in the coin toss. The over on two minutes on the national anthem. Please tell me this is a parlay. Like a 15. no, but that's a nice <laughs> idea. That is a nice. That would pay all the money. That is a nice idea. You'll even bet on heads or tails, and how long the national anthem will be. Well, you have to bet on heads or tails. I mean, you have to start you off, too. you know, with a bang or try to catch up. Wow, wow, Jeff, how rich! That's all I'm saying. I don't well, know how much money. Depends how this weekend goes. <laughs> we'll see. I'm also gonna play the poker bowl, so I could be you know, so, so, so rich on Monday or so, so, so busto on Monday. Man, I got to hope that you're still on the Poker News podcast by next <laughs> week. And I'm way out of the loop, guys, because I thought Tom Brady was, he played for the 
team from the Patriots. I'm, I thought that oh. was, but now he plays for a for Florida team. What the football's so bizarre. I don't know. Anyways, all right, cool. Well, um, Chad, I don't, you don't, you can't bet. You live in Wisconsin. He yeah, could actually, probably find a way to bet if you wanted yeah. to. I actually had somebody ask me the other day about how is the best way to bet on on this football game, and I said, well, in Wisconsin, there's not a lot of options, and I kind of laid it out there for him, and I don't think he liked any of them, which <laughs> which is more of a reason. Let hey, Wisconsin, let's get the let's get some sports betting, let's get some online poker going, let's uh, let's be a leader instead of a follower. Yeah, I like it. I want to see your email to your reps. Um, well, I want to just copy paste probably. Um, all right, cool. Well, thank you guys so much, of course, for listening and for sharing in the joy of our impending Poker News baby. Poker News family is expanding. Yeah. Uh, Chad, I'm going to suggest you go back to your cave where all of your comic people are. There was quite a few times where you got a little, uh, I think you're farther away from your router maybe now. So, even But the I'm audio sure. caught up. It was weird. Like Chad would freeze for two or three seconds, but then you would hear what he had to say just in fast forward. You would just say it really fast. Like, right. You froze it for a second, and then you'd be like, I'm just really far all. Get it all. Anyways, I'm just saying. Um, all right. Thank you guys so much for listening, and we will catch you guys next week. Deuces. The key to winning big is using every little bit of knowledge to your advantage. At Odds Checker, we give you the edge. Better odds, better picks, and better offers to make you a better better. Why settle for less? Quickly compare the odds at every sportsbook to ensure that you're getting the best price to maximize your return. Visit us at www.oddschecker.com backslash US. Odds Checker. Sports betting smarter.